I think that's it. Let's go ahead and open in prayer and we'll jump into today's lesson. God, heaven, thank you for your word, your truth, who you are and what you have mean to us. More so than even just a, a promise of salvation, but we have been given understanding, assurances. We have a purpose in this life and we will have a purpose for in eternity. It is more than we ever would uh, um, understand. It's more than we deserve and it's more than we even expect. We cannot understand and we do not even to even conceptualize what will be given to us in glory. Help us to rely upon that through all circumstances, the difficulties that we have. We appreciate all that you are and all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, here we go. Let's see here. Excellent. Now, once again, if you're kind of uh, looking at this for the first time, the top path is basically a timeline of the church. The bottom path is a timeline for what happens on earth while we are actually being uh, prepared to return with Christ to rule and reign. Um, so far, we have gone over current age, rapture, Bema, Israel, and what's happening during the immediate aftermath of these situations. And we have been talking about Jacob's trouble. So once again, the rapture church, Jesus Christ will return in the clouds, bringing all, bring in all the saints who have died and, and gathering all who remain with him in the air. Um, then you will have the Bema, which is the judgment seat of Christ. This is dealing with the, um, this time is where we, believers will be evaluated for rewards, not for determination of destiny. We also have um, Israel during this time, where Israel, Israel, um, will be in the beginning influenced by the man of lawlessness, and they will soon sign a seven-year treaty with him. And if you're understanding the man of lawlessness, we'll get into more of this today, is basically Satan's puppet, Satan's pawn, who basically puts himself up as God, as in, in that kind of that unholy trinity, uh, the dragon, the man of lawlessness, and the false prophet. Well, remember in Daniel chapter 9, it talks about this. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Um, and then he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But, will put, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wings of abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until the complete destruction one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. It's important to remember that our understanding of the man of lawlessness comes in part from Revelation, but a big majority of that comes from Daniel 9 through 12. So if you ever want to study this to its extent, uh, Daniel 9 through 12, but there may be a study coming up from the pulpit here at some point on the book of Daniel. Not by me. Shh. Oh. Maybe. We're still discussing. During this time, um, during the time of Jacob's trouble, which is that seven-year period, so, uh, and just for because of no, the nomenclature that is there, I will go ahead and continue calling it the tribulation. I prefer to call it Jacob's trouble because of the, um, it's a better term. The tribulation, basically, where they get that term is from the persecution of the saints, persecution of the remnant, which the, ter the tribulation, it actually refers to the persecution. It does, you never find where the tribulation refers to the judgments of God, the seals, the trumpets, or the bowls. We've been discussing the major events in which we have the day of the Lord, which is just overall, I would say, the main concept there. Uh, there are questions as to what it refers to. It at least refers to the seven-year period where basically God sets up his um, judgment upon the earth. Some people believe that moves into the millennial kingdom. I don't hold that view, but I also don't dismiss that view. Um, I understand what they're saying. They say a lot of times in that day, Israel will be redeemed. Israel will be, you know, it will be at peace. And um, is it referring to the day of Lord or not? It's a question. It's a good question. We also talked about um, the seal judgments. We talked about the trumpets. And we left off there. Now we're going to be heading to the bowls, the vials of wrath. 
And of course, we will culminate with the return of the Messiah, but that will be in a few lessons from now. So in dealing with the time of Jacob's trouble, we talked about the judgments of God, and we've dealt with the seals, which are the Revelation 6. Um, God shows how judgment will steadily escalate during this time of Jacob's trouble. The first five seals are broken by Jesus and unleashed by God himself upon the earth, but notice that the activity is that of the man of lawlessness. So primarily the sealed judgments is God unleashing who the earth deserves as a ruler. They deserve, based upon their obstinance, their immoralities, their murderous activities, their idolatry, and their not believing in God, they deserve this man, and they will follow him. So it's primarily about the false messianic kingdom and the establishment of it. This is not fire and brimstone just yet. God judges humanity by giving them the ruler they deserve. And that's, again, that's the first five seals. But when you get to seal six, this is the first inkling we get of God's overt shaking of the earth. I get the idea of shaking from the earth, not only from the particular judgments that are there, but also from Haggai and in the, the, the kind of the broad scope of God's judgment upon the earth. He calls it once again, I will shake the earth. And what we talked about last time is not only does he shake the earth, he also shakes the entire universe, all of creation, all of what we call the cosmos. OK. So seal six, broken by Jesus, unleashes a devastating earthquake that is accompanied by set by severe cosmic disturbances. Now, what we'll find out is this happens again, but to greater severity. So a lot of times what you'll see is in seals, you'll see a, a, something that's devastating. In the trumpet, like, oh, that's really, really devastating. And then you get to the bowls, ah, this is the ultimate devastation. And a lot of them kind of like mirror one another, but then you get into the concepts of greater in impact, greater in severity. So these vile, uh, so we're after the seal judgments, you get into the, Trumpet judgments. This is um, Revelation 8, 9, and 11. And these events are, more, are severe and terrible. Some have tried to put these judgments into a modern context. We talked about that last week. Uh, nuclear weapons, smoke from oil refineries, red tide, and so on to describe what's happening within the earth itself. But these are tied directly to God. You see something coming from heaven. You see something that occurs on the, on the, on the, on the people and upon the, the seas and the waters that I do not believe can be explained by natural events. When we see God move, we have to understand that the movement comes from an overt stance so that people recognize this is not natural but supernatural. How will they explain it away? Why will they blame God or, you know, will they blame him as some type of alternate God to their God, which will be in the man of lawlessness and the dragon? Or how will they do that? I don't know. But they, they will obviously not mistake the concept that when they look up and when they look and look at the water, look at the land and look at what's happening around the world, that they will not mistake that for some that type of natural occurrence. During this time, we read these passages. We want to notice that this is in um, not a metaphorical stance, but rather in a reality. There's no room for speculation. If there is some language like similes, how and as, we take that in the direct context of what they're talking about, but not as, as far as the whole judgment goes. For example, uh, when we talked about the locusts, I believe that they are, in fact, demon locusts. They look, they have an appearance as, okay? So that's, that's where the, the appearance is where it gets into simile. It's not what they are, it's what they look like. But the actual description of them is locusts. Okay. Trumpets one through four progress from the land to the seas, to the rivers, to the springs, to the light bearers of the sky. And all of them state as a one third of them was struck. One third. 
one third of the seas, one third of the waters, one third of the land, all the green grass, which is interesting, all uh, one third of the trees, one third of the stars, one third of the sun, one third of the moon. And at the end, what happens? One third of the men die. Trumpet five is a relentless, vile demon army. I'm not sure about you. I don't want to be here for that. That's that just sounds. And the text says that these demonic locusts torment men, but it's those who do not have the seal. So those who have the seal of God, much like it is in the in the Old Testament during Passover, when the uh, the um, the angel of death came and struck those who did not have their mantle covered and did not take part of the Passover. Similarly, these locusts will ignore those who are saved during this time. That's comforting. They do this for five months of torment, but they do not kill anyone. They don't die from this. They might die with it, but they're not dying from it. Trumpet 6 has God releasing them four messengers. It says angels in our text, and automatically we think that these are God's angels. But, but those four messengers, basically, it comes in the form of 200 million man army from the east. Now, are these four armies that make up 200 million men? I don't know. It, 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 this, this gets kind of vague in that text. I basically say these four messengers um, are that are bound up at the Euphrates come... And that army kills a third of mankind. This is where you get that last third. Trumpet seven is a little confusing, but the typical understanding is that this trumpet releases the final woe, um, which is the seven, the seven vials or bowls of wrath. That's the final woe. Um, so it's like it's it's it's, it's bundled. I'm not sure if you saw the State Farm. Never mind. That seven things, not if you bundle them. Sorry. Now we get into the bold judgments. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16. Now, as before, we mentioned in the um, trumpet judgments, there is a repetition of one third. This past week, I started asking myself a question. Why one third? Why one third? Um, obviously, to get people's attention, there's a lot of things that have to occur in order to be able to for God to say these are actual judgments. And my dis my conclusion is why one third? I believe this is one third, thirty three percent, because He's giving people ample warning. God has the right, at the moment, at any time He desires, to go ahead and destroy everything. One swell swoop. The progression tells me that he's given them information. Now, perhaps some people, a limited amount of people, do respond to the seal judgment number six. Do respond even to the fact that the man of lawlessness is revealed. And they realize, oh my goodness, we're in the day of the Lord. I'm, and they respond to it. Very, I think very few, but I do think they do. Um, I think more Jews than Gentiles, but you know, I think there will also be a number of Gentiles who respond. But it's going to be very small in comparison to the population of the world. But I think God allows the progression to steadily increase so that people will be able to recognize what's happening and be able to believe in the true Messiah, not this false one. Now, in Revelation 16, we have the six bowls of wrath, and then obviously you get into... Um, the seventh vial in the latter portions of chapter 16. These are the most severe of the judgments of God. In the trumpets, we have similar targets. The sea, the land, the water supply, the food, all these things. But it moves from one-third to all. These plagues are not unfamiliar to us. If we've read the Old Testament, we would absolutely recognize the fact that these plagues are similar to the plagues of Egypt. And the wrath of God is predicted in the prophets. As Luther stated in his lessons in dealing with the book of Revelation, John is not shocked by what he sees. 
Now, he might be shocked at the severity of it, but he understands these are the judgments God uses to get humanity's attention. In Revelation 16, verses 1 and 2, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Now, we have to make sure we recognize that this is not the first wrath. The trumpets are wrath. The seals are wrath. When God is the one pouring out the vengeance, even if it comes in the form of a man of lawlessness, similar to that of Saul be given to Israel because that's what they desired, it is part of his judgment upon that nation. And so, therefore, unleashing the man of lawlessness is part of his wrath. It says, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast who worshipped his image. Who gets the sore? The people who have basically bent the knee, taken the mark, worshipped the beast. This malignant sore is not a temporary thing. Remember the boils that were in Egypt? That was more temporary. This lasts basically till the end. Uh, we even talk about that during Trump, during the, the sixth bowl of wrath. These sores are a, devas are, are a devastating affliction to those who are afflicted. This is a painful a, a, a severe judgment of God. In verse 3, we have the second one. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood, like that of a dead man. And everything in the sea died. Remember, last time something was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the things died, and a third of the ships uh, were destroyed. There, now, what do we have? Everything. All the sea. Can you imagine taking a satellite image and all you see is red? Ah, scary. Yes. Vial 3, verses 4 through 7. The third angel poured out his bowl in the rivers and the springs uh, and the waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are, who, who are and who were. O holy one, because you judge these things. Now, here again, we have, okay, the malignant sores upon all humanity, all the ones who have bent the knee to the, to the beast. You have the second angel into the entire sea. Now, if you take away everything that's in the sea dying, um, that takes away a lot of food supply. And the third angel pouring in the bowls and uh, the rivers and springs, and they became blood. Not just the rivers, but the springs. A lot of times when you have a bad water supply from a river, you can dig down and get to a underground source, which is more pure because it runs through um, limestone and various different mineral rocks to purify the water to be able to drink it. That's not going to be available anymore. What are they going to have to do to survive? Probably drink it. It's probably going to make them sick. And many people are probably going to die just from the drinking of this water. What else are you going to do? You have no water. Is this too severe? Now, a lot of people, when they realize, this, oh, yeah, because all these people are evil. What about the young children? What about the babies? And people are like, oh, that's, that's too severe now. Because... And I, I like to shake it. At, no, it's not. No, it's not. Right? It's not. Why? Here's the response. Here, here's where we have to develop our worldview. It's not from what we see and how we judge and how we think it should go. It goes by what God says. Holy and righteous are you because you judge these things. Why? Verse 6. For they, the entire population of those who have been for this, they have poured out the, the blood of saints and prophets and have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Regardless of how we evaluate, we need to understand the evaluation of God and understand that he is just and true. 
verses 8 and 9 is vial 4. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given it to men to scorch with fire. Men were scorched with the flame heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who had the power over these plagues, and they did not change their minds so as to give him glory. What do we have here? We have global warming. I believe in global warming. It just hasn't happened yet. Can you imagine being scorched by the sun? Now, I am ginger, okay? Um, I, I, when I was at, down in South Florida, I'd go mow my lawn, and I would put on SPF 90, you know, spray it on real thick. I look whiter than I do now. I'd go out into the sun, start mowing my lawn. 15 minutes later, if I didn't get on, go inside, I would burn. That's, that's a pretty severe sun, especially during the summer. They ain't seen nothing yet. Vial 5 is in verses 10 through 11. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne the, of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. Darkness. Darkness falls upon the messianic kingdom. It's very much like the ninth plague of Egypt. Now, I do want to turn to this one because I, I want you to see exactly how this kind of plays out in Egypt as kind of a contrast to that of the, uh, the false messianic kingdom. So hold your place here and turn over to Exodus chapter 10. When it says darkened, I don't think we always fully appreciate it. Again, have you been have you been in a dark room? Um, again, um, I follow the the train of thought that Luther taught, and that I don't think that there will be a whole lot of electronics. I think there will be devastation. I think that power plants and the ability to create power will be diminished, if not completely eliminated. I don't think we'll be, they'll be having cell phones. I think this would be a very uh, primitive state, which is why we don't see, a whole, don't see vehicles being mentioned. I think we see horses being mentioned. You see armies and foot soldiers being mentioned. People are like, oh, these are tanks. I go, uh, I think we're dark ages again. I think that the, the supply, the ability, maybe EMP dis destructions, I'm not sure exactly how the war goes. It's very interesting, though, um, because when he says this about darkness, he says, in verse 21, it says, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky. Verse 21, I'm sorry. Exodus 10, verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be what? Felt. How do you feel darkness? Oh, you feel darkened. Interesting. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was a thick, a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. I have no idea what this is. This is not simply the, the sun being blotted out. You can't see the sun. Something else is going on here. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwelling. What does that tell me about darkness? It's not just about sunlight, starlight, moonlight that their light sources won't work. You can't light a fire and you can't see each other. Ominous, devastating, scary. Go back to Revelation chapter 16 and we'll pick this reading up here. In dealing with this darkened, I find the next phrase interesting. I think it can be explained by other things, but I, I think there may be something more here than what we normally see. And they nod their tongues because of pain have you ever been in so much pain in a certain area of your life that you actually cause pain in a different part of your body to kind of alleviate the, the previous pain it's kind of like what's happening here it's called open pathway theory where basically you cause more pain in one area to alleviate pain from another why the pain well in exodus the darkness can be felt Will the darkness cause pain? Maybe. I don't, I'm not sure. Because it's interesting also because the next thing that, that is mentioned in this text is that they blaspheme the God of the heaven because of their pains 
and their sores. So you have the sunburn, scorching. You have the malignant sores. And then you have this kind of innocuous, so we don't understand pain from the darkness. Again, is it just the pain from the other previous two? Maybe. I'll go ahead and, and, and not dismiss that. But I do think that there may be something tied to the darkness and some type of pain they receive from that. The one implication that we can take from these plagues is that they're all on top of each other. In other words, is this over a three-year period? I don't think so. I think this is kind of like the last like you know, month, two months, um, but severe. So this is basically, you know, hard living for a, for a little while, not not for years, but probably for a couple of months. This is the the wind down or the kind of like that that, that final that final push of the climax of God's judgment. Vial six verses twelve through sixteen deals with the drying up of the river Euphrates. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, and the Euphrates and its waters were dried up, so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. In verse 19, it talks about Armageddon, and it's, I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, the unholy trinity. We'll talk about that briefly in, short, in just a moment. Three unclean spirits like frogs, for they, they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes, so he will not be walk around naked and men will not see the shame. And they gather them together to the place when the Hebrew is called Har Magadon, which we know where the location is. It's north of Israel, near, uh, near Syria. So the Euphrates dried up in preparation for that slaughter. In, ver in, in verses 17 through 21, we had the final bowl. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple, the throne of God. It is done. The seven bowls have been poured. And there was flashes of lightning and sounds of, uh, sounds of peals of thunder, and it was a great earthquake. We already had an earthquake in seal six, which everyone felt. Now you have this earthquake. And what happens during this earthquake? I mean, have you ever have you ever felt an earthquake? Has anybody ever been part of an earthquake? Yeah, you just felt it's it's always a little weird, right? Like there's a oh ground unstable, but you don't you always know that it's going to be for a very temporary time. What happens during this earthquake? The earthquake was mighty. And when God says an earthquake is mighty. I'm pretty sure we got to take that very, very seriously. How seriously? The great city was split into three parts. The cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierce wrath. Every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. That's a big earthquake. And not only that, but what else do you have? Huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men. And, bla and, and men blasphemed God because the plagues of hail, because the pl its plague was extremely severe. 100 pound hailstones. We complain when they're the size of a quarter. Thousands of the bulls. These judgments of God, they afflict the whole earth and all nations. This is due to their siding with the beasts. They are the epitome of idol worshipers. Why? Because they, fi they, they finally worship the one that's behind all the idols, and that is Satan. They are immoral. To what extent? It's not written. But when God calls people immoral, we probably have an idea of what they're doing. They are violent. They are murderers. They turn over their, their friends. They turn over their brothers, their mothers, their kids to the beast to be executed. 
They are the absolute peak of what the Bible calls wickedness. Look at Revelation 9, 21. An unfortunate translation, even since the 1400s, of the word repent. They believe that they are right in doing things. Have you talked to somebody who believes that something very immoral and they and they actually believe that they're right, that this is good? This is progressive. But the word repent there is a change of mind. So it's not just I'm doing things I know I'm wrong. I believe that they believe that they are in the right. They did not change their minds of their murderers of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their immorality, nor of their thefts. They are completely hedonistic and draw everything into themselves. And they do not change their mind from that perspective. These are the reasons why good judgment of God comes upon men. We understand that from Ephesians chapter 2. We understand that from the Old Testament in dealing with the wrath of God that is poured out in the flood. Sodom and Gomorrah, the Amorites, all these things. Idolatry, immorality, violence. Those three things culminate into wickedness. And that is why God judges. And he is fully ripe to do so, even the entire population. This is severe and horrible. No doubt. No question whatsoever how bad it is. But it's justified because of the how wicked the earth has become. All these judgments and plagues hit the earth, but who are protected over and over again? It's the remnant who fled to the mountains. Now, based upon the past actions of God and the fact that many passages mention the plague is upon the kingdom of the beast and those who follow him only, we can infer that the remnant who are not in the mountains are also protected. Only the beast and those who are of his ilk are chasing those people who are not of his kingdom. What about the Gentile believers in the nations? I don't know. My suspicion is God is protecting them, but that is not mentioned. We do know that they are there are survivors after all these plagues. We know that from Matthew chapter 25. And he gathers the nations when he comes. These are not dead souls. These are actual people who have survived the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. There are believers and unbelievers. But it is unknown if the believers who survive are untouched by the plagues of God. I, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to make that statement. I think so. I really hope so. But it does not say that they're untouched from these plagues. I mean, can you imagine being a believer and everyone else is drinking blood and you open up your faucet and, yeah, you got water. That'd be kind of cool. That you go outside and everyone else is being scorched and you're walking around going, what's the problem? I don't understand what's going on. Now, I don't think it's going to be like that kind of melodramatic, but, yeah, I don't, I don't, it's going to be very interesting. Well, that took, well, at 30, I have, I have a little bit of time. Let's go ahead and, and, and pick it up here during with Satan's activity here. Let's go ahead and talk about here for just a moment um, that we have the enemy, the false messianic kingdom, identified by the prince who is to come, the king who does what he pleases, the man of lawlessness, the antichrist. Um, once again, these are not names. We don't know his name. These are descriptions. There's many descriptions for this individual. These make uh, he, he is kind of the centerpiece of the unholy trinity. Um, when you look at the uh, of Revelation 19:20, we see that the unholy trinity mentioned. We also saw that back in uh, in in the uh, Revelation 16. But Revelation 19:20, it says the beast was seized, and with him the false prophets who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire, which were burned with brimstone. In verse 20, in chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, the great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil. So here we have 
a understanding. If you go back into the into the text and read Revelation 13, 11 through 18, and Revelation 13, 1 through 9, um, you have a dragon standing on the seashore, and there is a beast from the sea. And that beast of the sea is the man of lawlessness, the prince who is to come, the false messiah. Revelation 13, 11 through 18 is the beast from the earth, which is the false prophet. And we see again this explanation in Revelation 19 and, and chapter 20. So you have these three individuals. The dragon is not really given a lot of activities during this time. It is primarily the false messiah, the man of lawlessness, and the prophet. The prophet is the one who does a whole bunch of signs. He's the one that makes the idols talk. He's the one that basically is able to do so many signs so as to, according to Matthew, deceive the entire world and, if possible, even the elect. The signs are great. The goals of this unholy trinity are very clear. He wants to build his kingdom. That's basically the, in the first seals, he's building his kingdom. He's, he's going around and conquering, building up his reputation as the conqueror, as the one who is going to bring peace. Now, I always find this interesting because the world, now we who pay attention, we know how it's false. But when you see a country, a people attack another people and then go peace. And then you see the kind of the negotiations specifically with other nations against Israel. How does Iran want peace with Israel? They, they say, we want peace with Israel. We, we want peace with Israel. Well, how do you obtain that peace? Israel's gone. That's how we'll have peace. I believe the world will be war torn. And by the time that the, the, that the beast comes up and makes this kind of connection, how do you want peace? Destroy all the people who are against us. Then we'll have peace. And everybody's going to go, okay. And we're going to go, what? How is that peace? A, a violence does not simply just end once you have it, even if that were possible. But he's building his kingdom through war. He's building his people through conquest. He causes all to worship him. That's part of his goals. Everybody worship me, the beast. And he points to the dragon, the unholy trinity. He destroys the nation of Israel. That's his, that's his goal. I'm talking about the actual physical nation. I'm talking about the infrastructure, everyone who's there. Obviously, he doesn't kill everybody, but that's his goal. He tries to kill all Jews. Primarily, he wants to kill the remnant. That's who he's searching for. Remember, he opens his mouth like a flood and God puts up a wall and says, no, nah, I ain't doing it. So he kills the he wants to kill the remnant. He kills all Jews and obviously those who are against him, who those who refuse to take the mark will also be hunted. He wants to kill all believers, eliminate the opposition and you rule the world. And remember the beasts. Satan's goal is to make God a liar. How can he do that? By eliminating Israel. If Israel is no longer, there are no Jews left, then he can't keep his promise. This is his goal. The main event during this time in scriptures is the abomination of desolation, where the man of lawlessness goes into the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and declares himself to be God. That is the main pinnacle point of this time frame. I do encourage you to kind of read this in, in, in 13, uh, chapter 13 especially, and just to see how, how he kind of works and this false messianic kingdom is built. Now, we don't have time. Um, to go into mankind, but we'll get to that next week, and then we'll jump from mankind and deal with the fact that we're going to return with Christ. So we're going to continue along with the progression um, and make sure that we're able to go into um, getting into returning with Christ, the judgments of the Messiah. We'll talk about that in, in detail. We'll talk about this kingdom established and the nature and characteristics of the kingdom. And of course, we will finalize with kind of characteristics and ideas about the eternal age. Let's pray, and we'll go ahead and, uh, and con conclude this lesson for now. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word, your truth, that we can take both a fear of judgment that's going to be upon the earth and know that we're not going to be part of that. 
but we pray that we also are motivated by it, that we understand exactly what's at stake, that we do not cease praying for those who do not believe, that we do not cease giving, giving opportunities for those who do not believe, and we pray that we are able to be clear and understandable and have opportunity to spread your truth, your good news, and the opportunity to, to, to um, remove judgment from upon us. Those who believe are not judged. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.